Alrighty, good morning everybody. Good to have you with us today. Welcome to church. Good to see so many here and glad that you didn't uh, listen to all the weather guys, but you uh, chose to just come on along and that's great. Good to have you with us this morning. Just a few quick announcements as we start today and, uh, and then we'll get into our worship service uh, right after that. First of all, we would encourage you to stick around after the service today for a bunch of reasons not the least of which is there are snacks so um we encourage you to do that um and and so don't rush away today our service is going to be a little bit shorter than normal and uh and then that's going to allow us to, to spend a little bit of time just hanging out together after the service today so please make sure you do that um and we're gonna have a good time and, and you're gonna have a good reason i think uh, to stick around uh, secondly, for those of you that are new to fellowship, those, those and in these COVID days, that could be named, but it's sort of started to come in the last year and a half. Um, but those of you that are new to fellowship uh, and want to get a little bit connected and sort of understand who we are and those sorts of things, we're going to start a, a new to fellowship group um, starting on September the 26th on Sunday evenings here at the church. And that's going to run for four sessions, so it's not a big long commitment. But we want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us a little bit and feel like you belong. And so we'd encourage you to do that. If you're interested in that, just see me after the service. Send me an email, um, however you want to connect with me. But we'll make sure that there's a spot for you. So starting on September 26th and uh, going forward on Sunday evenings, that's sort of our game plan uh, from there. Um, last sort of restart message that I, I have for you today is our Solid Ground Bible Study is going to restart um, also in September, October. Just gonna We're working through some dates to start that. And that's where we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, uh, in sort of a survey form and just sort of get the, the big ideas, the big thoughts of what God has to say in His Word to give us a solid ground, a solid foundation on which to, to build our faith. And so we'd encourage you to be part of that if you'd like to. That's a Sunday afternoon uh, activity here at the church. So um, you can see me afterwards on that. Now, just fair warning, we're going to restart it. So we're starting uh, in the book of Job, I think. We're gonna, we are gonna we finished basically all the books of history. We're going to start in the books of poetry. So just you're, you're jumping in at an okay spot. Um, you just missed some of that history that uh, happened beforehand. So... Anyway, um, if you're interested in that, that's a Sunday afternoon for a couple hours. Every other week, we'd love to have you join along with that. And so you can see me afterwards if you're interested in being part of that as well. Let me pray for us, and then we'll ask the worship team to come and, and share some songs with us today. Father, thank you for the blessing of gathering here today. And thank you for your goodness in allowing us to gather. We, we want to come here today and, and not worry about weather not worry about activities, not worry about what's coming next in our day. Just we've, we've come here in this hour to stop. To stop and quiet our minds and to worship you with all that we have. So God, allow us to do that, I pray. Help us to set aside the busyness of the week and the, even perhaps the busyness of the day and to worship you. God, we would ask that as you speak to us through your word and through these songs that we're going to sing today, that we will see a reason and a purpose to glorify you and only you. And so we give you this time together today. God, be with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, fellowship. Can I get a nice good morning back? I, I don't know if I can hear you. Good morning. So wonderful to have you all here this morning. We hope you are excited to worship God and the rain's held out. So all the more reason to uh, worship God this morning. Amen. All right, let's stand and worship God together. me 
There's nothing to fear, for I am safe with you. Come on, lift this up. So when I fight, fight on my knees, with my hands lifted I, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. If you are for me. And if you are for me, who can be against me? Amen. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Come on, sing this out. When all I see are the ashes, you see. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted I Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs. Church, I just want to take a moment this, uh, this morning uh, to read from Isaiah 40. Now, I don't know about any of you, but Isaiah, personally, one of my favorite, favorite books in the Bible. I got the incredible opportunity uh, at Bible college to take an Isaiah class, and it was just so life-giving. And I want to read a little bit from Isaiah this morning, because this next song we're about to sing is taken right out of these verses. And I want you to hear this this morning, all right? So it says this. This is Isaiah 40, verse 30. It says this, Youth may become faint, and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen this morning, church. Such an incredible promise to us in the scriptures. I want us to think about that as we sing this song. You are the everlasting God. 
living for sin and the peace that endure thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. really be considering i think in these days it in so many ways should be a refrain that we sing over and over again that god is faithful and i love that last verse um, that's one of my favorite hymns of all time but i love the the phrase that comes it says strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside but what a what a good word for us today because um, today we might be going through some difficult stuff, and so we need strength for today. But more than that, we need hope for tomorrow. We need, we need hope that as things progress on, that regardless of what comes, we have hope. And the, the thing that gives us hope isn't us, it's who God is, and it's his faithfulness to us and to his word and to his people. And the blessings of God are faithful every single day. I hope you caught those thoughts as you sang through those words. And as we think about where we're going from here or sort of where we head from here, um, I wanted to take some time today to, to encourage us to, to get going. You may, you may be wondering why I asked everyone to wear their running shoes today. And we're not going for a hike, although you're welcome to. There's some trails back there after the service. Go for it. Watch the poison ivy. Um, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not running track meet today. But what I want us to think about was um, getting ready to get into action. And, and so running shoes as opposed to, you know, heels or sandals or dress shoes or heaven forbid the boots that Alec wore this morning um, get in the way of us doing stuff. He told me he didn't have running shoes. It's like, seriously? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I just give him a hard time regularly. I was going to get white out and put a Nike swoosh on the side of his boots. But anyway... They, they, they make us think that we're going to do something, don't they, when we put on running shoes, as opposed to all the other shoes that we could put on. And, and I hope that going forward, every time you put these shoes on that you're wearing right now, you'll think of this message. So not to discourage you from wearing these shoes, but I hope it's an encouragement actually going forward. Because I think, honestly, we're sitting at that at one of many tipping points. As a church and as the church in general, we're sitting at a tipping point. And what we do in response to that reality, I think, in a lot of ways will shape the way the church looks and acts and does for many, many years to come. So, so the, the moment we're in today is an important one because it's a, it's a reminder that we sit at a spot where a decision has to get made. And one way or the other, depending on which way you make those decisions and we, we choose those actions, will depend on what church looks like for a long time going forward. So that's why the running shoes, because we need to get 
going. In John chapter 9, you can turn with me there, Jesus has had a, a busy little while. So um, in chapter 8, he'd gone through a whole bunch of things. We'll talk about those in a minute. But, but it, this, is, this is smack dab in the heart ministry of Jesus. So, so we're right in where the busiest time of his ministry life is, is found in John chapter 9. And, and there's a, a familiar story that begins that chapter. And, but there's this one verse right in the middle of it that Jesus puts in there. And I don't think it was just by accident. He wasn't trying to just fill a gap. I think it was really strategic what he said, and I want to, to, to land on that and to think about that today as we consider what do we do from here? What do we as a church do from here? So let's read uh, the first seven verses of uh, John chapter 9, and we'll, we'll dig into what God has to say for us. This is what it says. And as he, that's Jesus, passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Here's the verse. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, these things, he spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Great miracle. Great miracle. And, and it's one of those ones that we, we learn about in Sunday school. When I was a little kid, I remember thinking, that's so gross. You did too. Don't, don't kid. Don't, don't, don't pretend that you're any more spiritual than me. You thought that was gross too. Jesus spat on the ground and made mud of it and stuck in the guy's face. Now think about that for a minute. And he, it was a good thing he was blind because he couldn't see it coming, I guess. That was the, the best part of that. But, but at the end of it, he, he does what he's supposed to do. He goes to the pool, washes, and Jesus gives him sight. It's, it's a miracle. It's an amazing miracle. It's one that we, we think about often when we think of the miracles of Jesus. Healing blind people was a big thing. So why would I choose this portion of scripture? And, and why in this story would Jesus say these really significant words? Because he says some of the most powerful words to you and to me today in the middle of this story. And I want to get a bit of the context here. I want to get a, a bit of the, the what's happened recently in his world. So, so just um, if you go back in, in chapter 8, you don't need to, to go there, but I'll just recount some of the stuff that's happened to you. He's, he's dealt with that woman who was caught in adultery, and he wrote something in the ground, and all of the, the people that were accusing her ran away, and he said, who stands here to condemn you? She said, no, and he said, neither do I. Go and stop sinning. Stop sinning. But he said, go and sin no more. And then he, he made that great declaration that I am the light of the world. And um, he did that in a very significant spot. He said that right in the Temple Mount, saying, I am the light of the world. And he said it on a really specific day, and we don't have time to get into that. But, but he was saying that he was the one that would bring light to the world. He then gave that really great statement, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you know Jesus, who is the truth, he will set you free from the bondage of sin. He then goes on and makes friends with the Pharisees by calling them horrible people, children of de the devil, they, that in fact they are deceivers and they are liars. And he says, you are kids of the devil. And then he finally makes that great statement that I am, before Abraham was, I am. And they actually picked up stones to kill him and miraculously Jesus escapes. The suggestion is that he, he got out of the Temple Mount um, the way he probably would have gotten out of it many times uh, through the Eastern Gate and down through that Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. That was his sort of go-to spot. Probably spent the night there and the next day entered back into the city. 
That's where we pick up chapter 9. So, so in the midst of this, this really busy, really significant portion of his ministry, and, and in the moment where people are ready to kill him, Jesus comes back into Jerusalem, probably with all kinds of um, extra eyes watching out for him, all the disciples on high alert. And, and as he's walking by, he sees this blind guy who's been blind from birth. So it wasn't like this guy was just there yesterday or something happened and he needed a miracle. He, this was a long-standing deal. And his disciples said, so why is this guy blind? And they asked the question. And Jesus confronts them and says, just so God can get glorified. That's why he's blind. That's the only reason. And then he says these things, because I think what, what, at this point, Jesus, I think, is, is looking at his disciples who are probably going, Jesus, we got to keep moving, because there's people here that want to kill you. And, and yet, in the, the midst of the most hectic time of life, Jesus stops, and he teaches them a lesson. He sees this guy, does the miracle. Well, in the middle of it, he makes this great statement, which I think is really the most important thing that we can get out of it today for you and for me. This is what he says. Look at, look at what it says. Verse 4 says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Those are some of the most profound words that Jesus ever says to his followers. He says, the whole purpose of us being here is to work the works of the one who sent me. That's why, that's why we are here, Jesus says. That's why we are here. Not me. We are here. To work the works of the one who sent him. To work the works of God. To do what God wants to accomplish in this place, in this moment, today. That's why we're here. And Jesus says, in the midst of all the busyness and all of the questions and why are we stopping for this guy? He'll be here tomorrow. He says, but the reason I'm here is to do what God has for me today. That's why I think the church and fellowship stands in a very interesting spot. Because the way we respond to this day, this period of time, and what we do going forward will shape the way we look for years to come. And it's time for us to get moving. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But he's not in the world now. And in fact, in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to his followers and he says, you are the light of the world. So here's, the, here's the, the, the connection point to what he has to say. While I'm here, I'm the light of the world. Well, I'm not here, guess what? You, my followers, you are the light of the world. I'm passing the baton to you. I'm passing the torch to you. I'm, I'm giving the obligation, the responsibility, and the blessing of being able to do what God has for us to do in this day. From me to you, that's what I'm doing. My followers, we, I'm passing it to you. You, you need to be. The light of the world. Can I just say this? That this is the moment that we have. This is our moment. This is our time. This is, this is what God has for us to do today. To do the things that please him. To, to do what is going to point people to him. And in these days, it is challenging. I do not dispute that one moment, but our mission hasn't changed at all. And this is day. And night is coming. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think he, what Jesus is really saying is that the, that the, the, the window, the, the opportunity is here right now. The, the, the opportunity that you have, that I have to, to live for God, to glorify him, to point people to Jesus, to, to share the good news of the gospel is now. It's right now. It's here. And this is day. This is our opportunity. And the night is coming. In other words, the opportunity will be gone. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. It might mean that, that we're not around physically, that, that at the end of our life, 
the opportunity is gone, which is true. Maybe the opportunity within the context of our country is gone. That might happen. I don't know. But, but I'm just saying this, that, that, that we do have opportunity now. And Jesus says today is, is day. It's, it's day now. But night is coming. The opportunity may not always be here. So what are we going to do? Are we going to wait? Or are we going to get going? See, I think, and I don't want to give him too much credit, but I think I know a little bit about the way Satan operates. Because I know what he does in my life. And I have a sense that perhaps it's the way he works in all of our lives. Because here's, here's the reality. If we are followers of Jesus, if, if we know him as our Savior, then, then he can't stop us from getting to heaven. But what he can do is lull us into a state of despair and complacency where we stop doing the works of the Father while it's day. So, so if he can't get us, then the next best thing that he can do is to make us so complacent in our faith that we don't make a difference for God with our lives. And we waste the day. And night is coming. So why do we have our running shoes on? Because this is day. And night is coming. This is our time. This is, this is our opportunity to do what we can do with this little short thing called life. What we can do for God. And Satan would love for us to be satisfied, to be complacent, to become content. And, and, and instead of that, can I just suggest a whole bunch of things? That we, we need to be, instead of complacent, we need to start getting assertive. And I know it is hard. And I know it's difficult. And, and I get that. I get that. And I... I to be honest, I looked for a whole bunch of quotes from a whole bunch of different people. And, and the best one I found was the great theologian J.R.R. R. Tolkien. Um, who, he's not a theologian, it's, just, it's a joke. Anyway, um, but here's the quote. Because I think this, this one statement, he was maybe a prophet. And if you read his books in light of faith... You see that, that our faith is, is woven through the stories of the Lord of the Rings. But here's, here's the quote that we get from a guy named Gandalf who is, happens to be a wizard. And, and the guy that is with him, his name is Frodo. And this is, what, this, this is the, the quick dialogue. But it's really a decision that gets laid before you and me today. And it's really what Jesus said when he said, this is day. But night is coming. This is what it says. I wish, I, need not, I wish it need not happen in my time, said Frodo. In other words, the stuff that was going on, he wished it wasn't in his lifetime. Have you had that thought in the last year and a half? I wish it wasn't in my lifetime. I wish it was someone else's lifetime. I wish somebody else had to deal with this thing and the frustrations of, of all of the restrictions and all of the, 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 the scares and the dilemmas and all of the stuff that we've had to deal with. I wish it wasn't. I wish it need not happen in my lifetime. So do I, said Gandalf. But here's the, here's the quote I want you to get. And so do all who see such times. But that is not for us to decide. What we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. See, that really boils it down, doesn't it? We, we wouldn't have picked 2020 and 2021 if we had an opportunity to, to live. We probably would have chosen to just take a hard pass on those two years in so many ways. But, but the, the reality is this, that this is the time that we have been given. And it, it is up to us to decide what to do with the time that we have been given. It's day. Night is coming. What are we going to do with the day that we have? That's really what it boils down to. After 18 months of slowing down, we need to get going. And does that mean that we're going to be like full throttle, all speeds forward? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this, that, that today we need to make some choices as to what to do with the time that's been given to us. 
And we can be despondent and sad and, and curl up in the fetal position and, and worry our lives away, or we can be doing what matters to God. That's the, really the choice that is there. Instead of being complacent, we need to be engaged. We need to be giving and not taking. We need to be faithful, not casual. We need to be effective, not entertaining. We need to be motivated, not satisfied. We need to be involved, not being bystanders. See, we need to get going. And here's the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the quick story right now. You, you, and, and maybe this is, this is good revelatory words for you, but, but you've probably at some point enjoyed a service or two over the past year, either, either as we gathered or, or as we gathered online. And, and this is what you might be thinking. And so let me just correct you now. But you might be thinking this, that church seems to be going along okay. They don't need to be involved. I don't have to do anything. Church seems to be going along all right. Can I just tell you this? That there's, there's a small group of people that are frazzled right now. They are, they are worn to the bone because they have given and given and given and given. That's the truth. And, and the reality is this, that we have, we have pared back and we have, we have scaled back all of the stuff we do. And the time is now for us to go. And if we're going to go, if we're going to go, we need everybody doing something. That's the reality. And, and so, so maybe you, you thought to yourself, well, church seems to be going okay. I guess I can just do my thing. I'll show up on a Sunday morning and... Uh, and, and I'll get the service, and it seems to be going fine. I need to tell you, there's a lot of wore out people behind the scenes, people you don't see. By the way, I'm not wore out. I'm, I'm excited about the opportunities that are ahead of us. So I am not one of them. I, there's people work way harder than I do on, in so many ways to make these things happen. But I need to tell you this. We need everybody doing something, everybody doing something. Because it is day, and night is coming. So what are you going to do in the midst? See, we, we have some great needs in our church. And in case you're like that dude at the, at the gate and are, we're blind as you walk by, there's a whole bunch of booths out the front. And, uh, and on them are opportunities to serve. And, and there's, a, there's a broad variety of things. I'll just give you the quick. There, there, we have Sunday school Teacher helper needs. We have, we have big needs there. In fact, the children are here today because there are not enough workers in our Sunday school right now. So, so, so there's your object lesson. And so the, the question is, if, if we don't have enough workers, what are the consequences for our children? There's, there, not to guilt you, I'm just, that's the reality. We have an outreach program for children called Awana that we run on Sunday nights. And it's starting up again soon, and they could use some more help. Just helping kids outside of the context of our church hear about Jesus. That's what they do. We have uh, a need in the nursery. If, if you could help us with the nursery once a month or, or once every two months, just spend one Sunday in there. What a great blessing to, to uh, moms that would be. We have people that we need to, to meet people at the, at the door to greet them, to, to get them to their seats. And these days we're going to need people to get people to their seats. And, and so we have needs there. We have a youth group that is growing so great. I mean, Alec is doing a fantastic job. He, he had over 20 kids uh, last week at, at youth. And, and so that's awesome, but it also means that he needs help. And so we, we all need to, to be thinking, how can I be part of that? There's, there's a worship team that is up here every single week. Today it was sort of a pared down one. Um, and we did that intentionally because we didn't know what the weather was going to be like. But the reality is this, that, that there's a worship team with a whole bunch of needs, not just the, the singing and the playing stuff, but there's technical stuff that, that could happen too. We have needs in order for our services to simply be um, all they can be. There's, there's needs for stuff like people to work in the kitchen, to make coffee every Sunday morning as soon as we get back to being able to do that. To, to make coffee, to do those things. We, we have grounds and we have a building that are getting old 
and need maintenance and we need people to be involved in that. So it's easy to complain about the stuff that's falling apart or breaking and all those things. We, we need people and a team of people to honestly get involved in doing those. We have huge needs within our church because all those all of those activities and events, they, they are wear and tear on a building that is now 22 years old. So all I'm saying is, and there's more, but all I'm saying is this, that perhaps you've been thinking somehow I, I, there's nothing for me to do. Like what I see on a Sunday morning, I don't really, they don't see a spot for me to serve. That, Church is beyond Sunday morning. We, we have needs throughout the week that, that you can be part of. And, and maybe you think, physically, I can't do too much anymore. Then, then can you do us all a huge favor and pray hard for us as a church? Make that your ministry to every day come before God and just ask him to bless the people and the ministries of this church. But what, I, what I'm saying is this, there's something that everybody can do. And we need everybody. And next week we're going to talk about the power or the importance of one. But right now what, we need to, what I want you to see is we have an opportunity and we need to get going. We've got our running shoes on. We need to get going. A couple of verses at the end in the, the epistles that I wanted to share with you at the end of this. And I'll just read them out to you. You don't have to go. I'll give you the references. Don't need to go there. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16 says this. Look carefully then how you walk. And by walk, he means live your life. So look carefully then how you live your life, not as unwise, but as wise. And what's the wise way to live? Verse 16, making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil. See, Paul says to the Ephesians, you want to be wise in life? Make the best use of the day that God has given to you because night is coming. Colossians chapter 4, a couple of pages further back in your Bibles, verses 3 to 5 says this, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. Paul says this, that be praying, be praying that God will open doors of opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. To declare the mystery of Christ on, on account which I imprison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. And then here's that word again. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. See, it is day. Night is coming. What are we going to do with the time that we have been given. I asked you to wear your running shoes today, and, and to be honest, I put these old ones on. They're kind of falling apart, and um, I, I, I actually toyed with the idea of getting a new, new pair of running shoes, and I, I hope some of you did, like back to school, um, and that's great, but I think my question is this. When we stand before Jesus, what do we want our running shoes to look like? Do them look all shiny and spotless like they were the day they came out of the box? Or is what's going to please our Savior, shoes that look like they've been beat up and dragged and hauled through all different kinds of places, doing all kinds of different things in order to do the works of the one that sent Jesus, to do the works that, that God wants us to do, to, to be the light in the world that God has called us to be. What are, what are your shoes going to look like when you stand before God? We don't get to choose the time. We get only to choose what to do with the time that God has given to us. We must choose well because it is day and night is coming. Fellowship, we need to get moving. Let me pray, and we're done. Father, thank you for your word, for the reminder that we have a, a blink called life to serve you. God, just impress on my heart 
the importance of, of making the best use of my time. It is, it is so easy, God, for me to, to spend time doing stuff that will not matter in eternity. And God, I dare say that, that we have all fallen into that trap of, of hiding away from doing what you want us to do because we did what we wanted to do. So God, forgive us of that, I pray. Help us to, to have eyes to see the need that is around us. God, help us to have a heart for those that don't know you yet and to have the courage to go and tell them about you. God, I pray that as we think about where we can be involved in the life of a little church in a small town in central Ontario, that, that you will be pleased to use us to bring glory to yourself and only for that purpose. God, help us to not seek glory for us, but God, help us to only seek your glory. And we know that you are glorified, that you celebrate when people come to know Jesus. God, help us to be faithful in telling others about him and making him famous. Help us to do it this week, I pray.